Welcome. I'm Roger Berkowitz. I'm the founder and academic director here at the Han Arendt Center, and I welcome you to this meeting of the virtual reading group. Um, as I'm sure you all know, we're reading On Revolution. Uh, this is a book Arendt publishes in 1963. Uh, it's her, uh, really her last uh, major uh, full monograph that she publishes same year as Eichmann in Jerusalem, um, and then she works on the book Life of the Mind, but um, never quite finishes it. Uh, we are uh, in the middle of chapters four and five. We finished chapter four, we're now reading chapter five, but as I said in the last meeting, chapters in four and five really do go together. Um, they are both titled Foundation. One is Foundation One and one is Foundation Two. Uh, the first one is the Constitution of Liberty, Constitutio Libertatis. Um, that is about how liberty is constituted, made to stand uh, in the world. And it is focused on the question of power. And the, the key thesis of Chapter Four is that in the American um, revolution, as opposed to the French and other revolutions, power was constituted and there was a almost inherent um, surging up of power from the bottom through the experience that the colonists had of self-government in town meetings, local governments, uh, on the Mayflower, even before the first um, uh, Western European colonists landed on the new, on, on American soil. Um, there was this habit and practice of um, self-government, of enjoying the process of, and thinking one has the right to govern oneself. And this was um, the sort of upsurge of power that uh, Arendt sees as habitual in the New World. And when the colonies rebelled against England, um, the first thing they all did, like 13 clocks striking as one, in the words of John Adams, they all went and um, wrote down and passed constitutions. Uh, and that these new constitutions were examples of this sense that these uh, colonists had of their right and ability to set out the terms of their self-government. Um, and, and that when they then came uh, a number of years later after the failure of the Articles of Confederation to constitute a new government with the United States of America, um, they again uh, were deeply moved to protect these experiences of power. Um, and they did so by not limiting the power of the state. So the problem of the Article of Confederation, as she understands it, is that the uh, states were each strong and powerful, but there was no way to overawe them, and thus there was too many conflicts and there was not enough of a union. Instead of taking away power from the states, which would have reduced power, what the Constitution did is create another power, the federal government, which had power um, over the states, but not in any way removing the power of the states. And so what you created was, again, a multiple and opposing power centers. And her argument is that it's this creation of diffuse multiple power centers um, in which power checks power, but there's no, um, but there's many different sources and, and centers of power is the source of American liberty. Um, liberty being on the one hand, the uh, ability to govern oneself through the collective use of power. And on the other hand, liberty being the protection from any one of these power sources becoming too powerful and 
um, and uh, uh, overawing the others and thus taking away uh, people's liberty. Um, so the, the federal structure, which she sees as the great innovation of American politics in chapter four, um, really is, it's not simply the, 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 the division of powers as we're often taught it in, in high school of the, of the president, the legislature and the courts. It's really also the fact that there's multiple different power sources through society. You'll, we're gonna come to in chapter six, her, her argument that the constitution actually failed to protect enough power sources. And when you see her discuss Thomas Jefferson's um, letter in which he says the big mistake of the Constitution was that we didn't protect local um, local town meetings and local town halls and local uh, groups that would um, have power. She's going to agree with Jefferson and she's going to say that's the that was the actual failure of the U.S. Constitution. Anyway, that's a I'm reviewing chapter four because they go together. Chapter five says, shockingly enough, I mean, this this multiple source of power, the United States, she says, is the only country that really had that because if you look at Europe and the revolutions in R Russia and France and Haiti and other places, there wasn't this habit of self-government. And so she says, they didn't have these traditions of power, but in America they did. And so she says, even though this was so important and so essential for what the American Revolution was and for the Constitution of Liberty, it wasn't the hardest part. It was sort of actually almost natural to the Americans to protect this power. The hard part, she says, is to provide a new source of authority. Um, and, you know, if you go back and you read and go and remind yourself of the essay, What is Authority?, which we read a couple months ago in this group, um, you might remember the first line of that essay uh, goes, in order to avoid misunderstanding, it might have been wiser to ask in the title, what was and not what is authority? For it is my contention that we are tempted and entitled to raise this question because authority has vanished from the modern world. So um, if authority, by and by authority, she comes to see the authentic and undisputable experiences common to all. Authority is um, something you obey, not because you're persuaded by it, and not because it's violently imposed on you, but because it's an authentic and undisputable right. So the, the two, the three, I guess, main sources of authority through history would be religion, where you believe it on faith and it's just what everyone knows to be true, um, uh, and tradition, custom. Um, I said three, I, those are really the two major sources of, of authority uh, through um, in, in, in the tradition. And um, we live, as, as Harent never tires of reminding us, at a time of the break of tradition, when the old uh, religious and traditional sources of authority can no longer um, be assumed to, uh, to be valid. Um, with the loss of this tradition and this religion, the thread uh, that has guided us, she says, and that provided this authentic and undisputable uh, truths for us, this common world, uh, has been broken. And we no longer have any sense of uh, an undisputed authority. And so in the essay, What is Authority? And it's worth just looking back on it now, uh, I hope you don't mind, she says, on pages 94 to 95 of Between Past and Future, authority resting on a foundation in the past as its unshaken cornerstone. So the unshaken cornerstone of authority, that past which holds us to it, gave the world the permanence and durability which human beings need. 
precisely because they are mortals, the most unstable and futile beings we know of. Its loss is tantamount to the loss of the groundwork of the world. So part of the art, what, you're not, what I'm trying to show you is that chapter five says, look, the Americans succeeded in creating liberty in the sense of protecting power. But that's great. I mean, you know, it's good that we have power and the liberty to self-govern ourselves. But we humans, we mortals need more than that. We need permanence and durability. And if all you have is power and people keep re, and if every time a new generation comes in, we say the, the last generation was unjust, the last generation was wrong, we'll never have stability and permanence and durability to the world. And humans can't live that way. Um, and so um, one of the problems, I mean, in fact, I think Arendt thinks the problem of the modern age is how in the world can a people in which the thread of tradition has been broken, when authority has been lost, um, somehow give rise to authority that will allow for the world to persist in a durable and permanent way um, uh, without violence or simply persuasion, which can't be relied on to do the job. Uh, that's a huge task, right? It's a huge task. And in this chapter, uh, chapter five, she says, the French went back to the drawing board and tried to do it through a kind of um, popular religion. Uh, the, you know, she says, all of the major thinkers of this period, John Adams, uh, Sies in France, Robespierre, they all thought you needed um, a kind of divine sanction. And um, they thus tried to make the people divine, or they tried to call upon science to offer a divine uh, sanction, um, and none of it worked. And she says, however, in some way, the Americans got it right. It's the one revolution, and it's the one example in the history of the modern age in which um, a new source of authority was created. And what is that new source of authority? Well, it's the Constitution. Um, somehow, she says, um, this Constitution came to be worshipped in America. It came to be worshipped as this quasi-sacred, divine uh, document um, that gives that that I with amidst all the changes and power and politics and justice and injustice in the world it is seen as the document that as long as it's binding and as long as it's worshipped gives um authority and thus permanence and stability to the united states and how this happened and why it happened is sort of part mystery and part brilliance. Um, uh, the brilliant part in her mind is that the American founders didn't turn to Rousseau once again, didn't turn to the try and divine lawgiver, but turned back to the Romans and um, saw that what the Romans had done is with their, uh, with their famous phrase SPQR, uh, which stands for Senatus Populusque Romanus, the Senate and the people of Rome. This is the, if you go, you know, in old ancient Rome, everywhere you went, you saw SPQR. This was the core of Roman civic life. SPQR, Senatus Populusque Romanus. And what it means is the Senate and the people of Rome. And our, our interpretation of this, which is not controversial here, is that the people of Rome were the power. That's where they had the power to make laws. But the Senate could veto laws and the Senate could say no. 
and thus the Senate was and the Senate was filled with nobility, with aristocrats, people who traced their origins all the way back to the beginning of the Roman Republic. And the idea is that the Senate provided a stability and a permanence and durability. It put a break on the changes that the people would make in the name of justice and did so in the name of their connection to the beginning. Um, but what she says is, the Americans did something quite brilliant, which is they shifted the seat of the authority from the Senate, which now became a sort of in-between between the House and, and a, 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 a still a powerful body, but to the Supreme Court. And it's the Supreme Court which had no power, but the authority to interpret the Constitution became the um, became the example of a body that would interpret the Constitution not in the name of interest, right? Not according to power, but in the spirit of the uh, beginning, but brought to the present. She's not an originalist. This isn't saying we, we have an original interpretation. It's actually quite the opposite. It's saying that what the Supreme Court is, as she says, is um, a constitutional assembly in continuous session. This was Woodrow Wilson's phrase, and she, she repeats it, but embraces it. And the premise here is, and this is a little weird, but this is what she's saying, the, the people, the Supreme Court justices, are actually reincarnations of the founding fathers. And they interpret the Constitution as if they were still the founding fathers thinking about the constitution, but today in our period. And, and, and thus, even though they make judgments based in today, their judgments as reincarnations, I mean, she uses the word reincarnation, of the founders gives their decisions uh, a permanence and a durability and a, and a holiness and divinity that is free from interest and reconnects us to the spirit of the beginning. And it's this uh, return, in a way, that uh, um, to the beginning and the carrying of the spirit of the beginning into the present that allows not only power to be found in, American, in the American Revolution, but authority. And that is really, for her, the great innovation of the American founding. Um, it's an extraordinary argument. Uh, you know, we can, uh, I think understanding it is one thing and, you know, and then evaluating it is another. She, she will then say uh, that it may well be that so long as people believe in the Constitution, um, you know, she says this on page 196, the bottom of that long paragraph on 196, and one may be tempted even to predict that the authority of the Republic will be safe and intact as long as the act itself, the beginning as such, is remembered whenever constitutional questions in the narrow sense of the word come into play. So whenever you interpret the Constitution with a spirit of the beginning of some sort, um, the authority of the Republic will be safe and intact. That's an extraordinarily claim. And it's, it's, I think, one of the most hopeful claims RN will ever make. <laughs> and yet, obviously, given the constitutional crisis that we're in, it's also a scary claim. I mean, I mean, one of the things I'll say quickly, and then I'm going to open it up for questions. Um, you know, for most of the history of the United States, um, you know, opinions were quite short because the judges were simply deciding them. What happened starting in the 1920s, um, really, uh, with the progressive era courts, is they begin writing longer and longer opinions. And now, of course, if any of you have read constitutional opinions, they're now sometimes hundreds of pages. and. The argument is that, well, what I'm suggesting is that 
instead of being decisions, they're now persuasions. They're trying to persuade. And as that happens, uh, the, the judges look more and more like people who are have interests and are trying to persuade people of their interests. And they begin using political language. And the result is that you now have court watchers who, you know, argue that it's about vote trading and it's about, you know, political positions and there's conservatives and liberals. And once you get to that point, it doesn't seem like the court is reincarnations of a founding moment. It seems like the court is a elite, non-democratic, supra-political body. Um, and it's hard, it becomes ever more difficult to argue that this Supreme Court has a kind of um, divine like status and to the extent that view of the court becomes more widely accepted which I think it's undoubtedly true that it has the reverence that Arendt sees as sort of the essential moment for the founding of authority in the United States becomes ever more attenuated um, clearly there is still a reverence for the Constitution. The Constitution still has that kind of reverence, but I think it's ever more weakened by in many groups um, today. And, uh, and that would be a very dangerous um, thing to see happen if you accept her argument. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop and, and take some questions. I see there's a, a couple. Uh, there's a long comment from Bob Meyerson. And he writes on page 196 of my edition, or 201 of, of yours. So let me see if I can find 201. Um, Arendt claims the novelty of the New World's political development was nowhere matched by an adequate development of new thought. At least according to one scholar, that is not so if we take new thought in a literary direction. According to David Noble, in his 1968 book, The Eternal Adam and the New World Garden, America did have a very new strain of thinking, deriving mostly from the revolution, but grounded in the idea of the covenant by which American immigrants and intellectuals thought they could escape from time, start entirely new, transcend the old world baggage, forge a new man, be a beacon unto mankind and achieve a dream, an American dream. Noble, of course, sees this as misguided and hopeless, a hopeless and harmful myth. I mention this to suggest that there may be a downside to Arendt's celebration of the foundation principle she detects, perhaps the seeds of populist weeds which have always been with us may have been embedded in the same beginnings seed bag that so dazzled Arendt's research into colonial confederation history. By shucking the chains of their European past, the first U.S. Americans may have failed to appreciate the limitations on their newfound freedom, like so many other revolutionaries ever since. By doing so, they may have set a path in an unattainable and tragic directions. Of course, Arendt was writing about politics, not the entire course of American history. Slavery wasn't the only original flaw in the new nation. Wow. Okay, Bob, that's a lot. Um, uh, so... I think the first thing to say is that, um, you know, she, I think is somewhat convinced by Tocqueville uh, that um, America didn't have really great thinkers. Uh, we can agree or disagree. Um, she, her view is that while there were some the Federalists and the Federal Papers and the Founding Fathers had some great minds. Um, they were more uh, figuring it out as they went along than they were following a plan. And that uh, they really figured it out through the experience of revolution. That's, that's really one of her arguments. Um, that there was no one at the beginning who sort of wrote down a plan and said, here's how we're going to do it. Um, uh, you know, your the, the the noble book that you are that you are mentioning, which I have to admit I haven't read, um, you know, says that post-revolution, right? 
if I understand what you write here, um, a, 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 an idea of the covenant and America, an American dream, an American, uh, a, a, a new, a new city on the hill emerged. And there's no doubt this idea of the city on the hill um, had already been had already been at one time mentioned in in the Mayflower or early on at Plymouth Rock, but also um, continued to be developed throughout the 19th century, and um, and that is true. Um, but our end is 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 less interested, I think, in in that argument um, of the city on the hill. She is interested in in the idea that there was, in her mind, a foundation of freedom based on these two constitutions, these two foundations, one of the constitution of liberty or power and the other of authority. Um, uh, so that's that's one. I mean, I'm happy to 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 hear to hear more about that. I mean, she's she doesn't really make much of the city on the hill here. Um, uh, she's not saying that these are people who, I mean, she does talk, uh, mention a couple times people who said they were trying to create something new and, and she takes that seriously. Um, but, you know, what she's really saying is, you know, these are people who wanted to live in a free world and they understood that they needed to protect power. That's one thing. And they understood that they needed authority. Um, and to a certain extent, they were able to protect power, not because they had great thinking, but because they had the experience of power and they didn't want to give it up. And they were able to create authority, again, not because they had great thinking, but because they wrote this constitution. They had one good idea, which was the Supreme Court, and they got lucky. Um, somehow this constitution came to be worshipped. Um, uh, and so I think, you know, I'm, I'd, I'd like, you know, I'm not sure uh, how that fits into the noble, the no, Mr. you know, Professor Noble's argument that you're talking about. As for the, um, the tragic and un unattainable direction, um, I think there, well, I mean, I wouldn't put it in such faded terms, but when we read next the next chapter on the revolutionary tradition, uh, you know, if you just all you have to do is look at the title, which is the the lost um, the lost treasure, the revolutionary tradition and its lost treasure. She's going to argue that this tradition has been lost, that it hasn't worked, that it hasn't been able to sustain itself. Um, I don't think she thinks that was a faded idea and unattainable. I think she thinks it was lost for a very particular reason. Um, uh, one of which was the corruption of the people, the turn away from public interests to private interests. And uh, the other was the, um, in a sense, the constitutional revolution that took place first with Woodrow Wilson and then later with FDR in which the incredibly important federalist balance between the different power centers of local state and federal government was um, shifted such that the federal government uh, became the um, not only overarching the states but increasingly disempowered the local government so that people, so that the very American heritage of local power and self-government became a, 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 an obvious joke and people therefore um, gave up their historical practice of political action and public action and concentrated simply on their private lives, which led to the corruption of the people. Um, I think that's her argument. Um, so, uh, on the question of slavery, yes, I mean, we know she thinks that was the, uh, ultimate and tragic and potentially unbridgeable flaw of the Constitution. Um, 
whether or not it is, in a sense, salvageable uh, is still, I think, an open question. Are there other? So, Roger, can you hear me? I mean, you asked a lot in your question. Happy to, happy to hear your thoughts on it. I'm not sure if you can hear me, Roger. I, I can. Um, I'm just wondering if it was a coincidence, the idea of uh, starting anew, which on the one hand, you mentioned the Mayflower Compact, and of course, uh, best they can create themselves according to their own designs or image. And then we we have a tight question and anything to do with one another or maybe this concept of uh, of starting a new played in what noble considers these myths so just raising the question not uh, not really trying to uh, to criticize Aaron just wondering if it all comes uh, comes together, or, or maybe not. And you know, ships passing in the night, or are they? Um, I don't know. Ships in tow. I uh, so I don't know, Bobby. You're looking like you're in a very uh, nice place. Um, the internet, I think, was a little bit spotty, but I heard most of what you said. Um, I, you know, the Aaron thinks these dreams or these stories are important um you know one of the one of the main one of the main arguments of her book the human condition um is that stories uh and storytelling are an essential aspect of public action and and politics and we create stories um and tell stories about actions and events and works and those stories help create the groundwork of our world, the, the world that lasts and is durable and, and, and plural. And so she's, um, she's not against stories in this, of the kind that are sometimes myths and which are always going to, in some sense, be simplifications of reality, um, but that provide a common tradition and authority. I think one of the big problems or questions is in an age in which we the thread of tradition has been broken and thus these stories are no longer um accepted in an un in a in a in, a, in an absolute way they lose their authority and then we're in this position of um openness where we actually have to uh discuss and think and see if we can somehow um, construct enough of a common world that uh, that allows us to uh, live together. And if we can't, as she says in the What is Authority essay, we increasingly just say, you live in your world and I live in my world and we're not going to talk to each other, which I think we all know is increasingly what's happening. Um, is there a way to create a common world? And and for her, the sort of genius of American political, political history, again, I think largely accidental, was the um, common world around this idea that the United States was a constitutional republic and what that means. Um, and that's, an ex you know, it's an extraordinary claim. I mean, the somehow... The idea was that this constitution was a matter of justice, was a matter of what united us, was something that we all had to uphold. And when a when the court made a decision, we could think it was wrong or right, but we obeyed it. And that's still an amazing thing to me that people accept what these nine justices have done. Um, when they're when what they do is so against people's interests. Um, so uh, that's how, that's, that's as best as I can do, at least at this point. 
I mean, I'm happy to, to have some more. I guess um, Aaron's uh, is sort of analyzing uh, the situation of the, deriving the Constitution. I, and these are two great chapters, actually, the most that I most I've liked in everything we've read. Um, but the genius of the founding fathers to recognize what you just said about this, all kinds of people. We don't have it now so much. Uh, we don't have anything like these guys <laughs> around now. We had Quakers and atheists and sitting, one realized the seriousness of what they were up to. They, they, they just sat together, argued together. If they didn't solve slavery, we got that. that that's, some, that's the mark they'll have to, <laughs> history will have to hold over them. But it took 600,000 American lives to solve it 90 years later. So it wasn't something they, they, they could have done easily. The thing about the Supreme Court, as you just mentioning here, the thing that you're almost lacking now is a recognition of wisdom on the court. You had Brandeis, Cardozo, others, you know what I mean? What you recognize are interest arguments, you know, uh, conservative, you know, that kind of stuff. You don't look, there's no sort of uh, uh, appreciation of what the wisdom of the Constitution is as it had been applied over the centuries or, or a couple of centuries to the real working life that Americans lived anyhow. But uh, anyway, it, I, I can't ever not acknowledge the founders, the genius of those guys. They did it. Thanks, Pat. I mean, I think, I think one of the big questions is were these guys sort of superhuman, right? That's one view. Um, and maybe some of them were. Or was there something about the moment and the experience in the United States where there was this moment of newness, but there was also this tradition of self-government um, that allowed it to happen. Um, you know, we had uh, Jim Fishkin at the conference the guy who spoke about his idea of deliberative polling. And I, what I really took from his talk more than anything else was that if you put a bunch of everyday Americans in a room, and or not Americans, any, any people all over the world. He's done it in a hundred countries, uh, in a room, and you give them a couple of days to talk to each other, and the ability to call in experts and bring in uh, people to, to give them information. Um, they will come to uh, intelligent, uh, deliberative solutions that are often quite similar to what experts would say, but uh, do it through a deliberative process. And what was most interesting to me about his, when he answered the question from one of my students, was when he said, look, if you just give them all the facts, they'll stay with, they won't make a decision. They won't come to a deliberative agreement. It's not that they, it's not what makes them come to the deliberative agreement is not information and facts. It's the actual process of talking it out with each other and people they disagree with. And um, I think what was amazing about the founding generation is that, you know, you had people who disagreed with each other and they sat and talked for months and argued it out and, uh, um, and, and were in a position where they felt like they had to come to a conclusion. And that was... Uh, that was, an, that was an amazing experience, um, and it's that deliberative experience that we are losing today. I mean, if I mean, look at when you have C-SPAN on and you look at the House of Representatives, you don't see much deliberation going on. You see posturing and PR, uh, and 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 that is a uh, and that is a, a real um, tragedy from a uh, from someone if you really do believe that the act of speaking and deliberation is important um, in, in, uh, in bringing people to the possibility of forming and recognizing a common world and a common authority that could be the groundwork of the world, as she writes. Um, Gary writes, the decision in Roe v. Wade is a perfect example of this idea that the court is now trying to persuade and in a way to legislate, which is not the appropriate role for the court. Yeah, so this is, 
you know, I think this is a, a very hard issue to talk about today and one that um, to me is, is, is absolutely essential and I'm glad Gary brought it up. You know, my, one of my old teachers and, and friends, uh, Robert Post, now the Dean of the Yale Law School, um, wrote an article a long time ago. Um, I forget the exact title, but it's like constitutional decision as risk taking or something like that. And the, if I if I remember it, the thesis, if I get it wrong, it's not his fault, it's my fault. But the, the argument of it is that when in certain big decisions, um, and he gave two examples, one was Brown v. Board of Education and one was Roe v. Wade. The court basically takes a, a risk. They say, look, we think that the opinion of the country is shifting in such a way that this will become uh, um, the common view of, 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 of the country. So in, in, in Brown v. Board of Education, they said the idea of legalized segregation of schools is seen as racist and uh, unconstitutional. And they got that right, in a sense, the, 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 the country, I mean, that's not even a controversial view in the country today. I, I mean, you know, it's just, I don't even know if the alt-right, nationalist right would contest that view. I mean, they might say we want voluntary segregation, but the idea that legalized segregation should come back, I think they, you know, it's just not, it's not on the agenda. Um, but what Post said is that in Roe v. Wade, they sort of took a gamble uh, a constitutional gamble that um, that uh, people would come to see uh, abortion as um, a, a morally legitimate idea, and they probably didn't win that one. Um, this is one in which the country is still wildly and deeply uh, divided. Um, and then there's the question of what to do about that. Uh, how do you um, respond? to that um and because the country is so divided um a decision like that can seem to many as a, a kind of political interested decision that chooses one side over the other i think the other side to that gary and i'd, I'd love to hear your opinion on it is that well what the the premise of 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 the constitution at least the bill of rights part of the constitution is that there are um, certain individual rights that are not to be um, uh, uh, tampered with by the political power process and the political interest process. And while obviously the right to abortion is not mentioned in the Constitution, uh, nor is the right to privacy, um, there is, and you know, here's the, 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 the penumbra's argument, but I think the most convincing argument that I've heard for finding abortion in the Constitution is that there's an equal protection clause in the 14th Amendment, and that the equal protection clause gives everybody a right to a certain kind of personal integrity. Um, this is Drusilla Cornell's argument um, in her book, um, The Imaginary Domain, that each of us have a right not only to not you know, be killed uh, or injured, but to have the right to imagine our, the integrity of our bodies uh, and to imagine the integrity of who we are. And um, for women, uh, that right includes to imagine ourselves as mothers or not, as, as, as people who give birth to people or not. And, um, and we should have the rights to uh, to make a, a strong, uh, to have a strong sense of identity of who we are in our imagination of who ourselves. And I find that a very persuasive argument personally. Um, uh, you know, on the other hand, uh, it's obviously not persuasive to um, large majorities in many parts of the country. And I think one of the big questions that we're faced with is, can we in some way um, without violating people's fundamental constitutional rights, allow some parts of the country to uh, have abortion and legalize it and others not to. Um, 
And as long as we're unwilling to do that, the left is unwilling to do that. Um, uh, this the and, and and as long as the country doesn't come to a consensus on it, uh, the court becomes politicized, and that's a very dangerous. I think that's a constitutional crisis. And so this is, I think, one of the, to me, one of the most important issues that we have to work through. Uh, Roger, this is Gary uh, Patton, and I just uh, have two quick responses. Uh, I agree with you completely, and I'm not familiar with the book you cited to, but uh, what the court should have done in Roe v. Wade, in my opinion, uh, taking the risk that would have been required was to decide that the right to an abortion uh, was a fundamental right that a woman had just the same way they decided that there was a fundamental right of privacy, although not explicitly uh, outlined in the Constitution. And my point was, if you actually read the Roe v. Wade decision, uh, the court itself is figuring out how it thought you should structure a law, three different areas in which uh, state action was either not appropriate or sort of appropriate or totally appropriate, uh, which I think undermined the ability of the people, uh, the residual respect for the Constitution, uh, it undermined their ability to say, oh, okay, that's what the Constitution means, liberty uh, for a woman to make that choice. I guess that is what the Constitution says. Because when the court is sort of making up a good reason why their scheme is a good scheme, uh, they're no better than anybody else. So then the second thing, and I don't advocate this necessarily, but when you talk about the left and a difficult issue, uh, if the court were to retreat on Roe v. Wade, we would be back into the realm in which federalism was important and each state would make its own rules. And that could, in a way, help you know, engender the kind of respect for our federal system that I believe you are absolutely correct is one of the great threats we have uh, today because everything is national and that is where totalitarianism, authoritarianism and a disempowerment of individuals and communities is most, uh, most easy to accomplish. Yeah, I, I, I'd love to hear from other people on this if people would like to say something. I mean, I... I find this one of the hardest issues for me personally. Um, I'm I'm personally uh, convinced that while I'm not a fan of abortion, I'm personally convinced that abortion is an absolute um, right that um, should be accorded to women. And yet, um, I also share Gary, you know, share the feeling Gary expressed, which is that. Um, sometimes, I mean, we, we have to decide which rights, uh, we will, um, we will protect as absolute rights. And, uh, if the country really doesn't agree, uh, at some point, and it's not in the constitution explicitly, which it's not, um, at some point, do we make a, a, a tactical retreat on the, to the federalist level? Um, I find this to be an issue I'm not, I actually don't have an opinion on. I, I almost feel like punting on it. I, I find it deeply problematic on both sides. And uh, I, I sort of feel stuck on it at times. I'm happy to hear other people's thoughts on it. This is not one that I feel confident in deciding actually. But maybe does people wanna, I mean, maybe we don't wanna, I mean, we don't have to, you don't have to see be pro or against if you're interested in thinking about the question. I mean, Roger, it, it might, it might depend on how a retreat is made. Mm -hmm. If, uh, I'm sorry, this is Jack. If the, um, if the court decided that, um, that the, that abortion is not constitutional because, uh, because it is murder, right? Since murder is clearly proscribed, it would really prevent the states from going ahead and uh, and making se separate kinds of laws. If, on the other hand, they found this is not appropriate for a federal purview, and for that reason um, uh, it is remanded to the states, that would be a whole other matter. But it, it would it really depends on if the how if there were a retreat as you uh, as we're talking about here, 
it all, de all would depend on how that retreat was actually uh, described and effectuated. And I personally believe that it's more likely to be some way to, uh, it would more, more likely be some way to prevent uh, further discussion rather than to allow for broader uh, interpretation around the country. Jack, I... oh, go ahead, go ahead, Mark. Hi, um, I was going to point out that, I mean, and this also goes back to what Gary was saying, that um, the opinion is structured by an analysis of when human viability occurs, which is intensely problematic for a lot of reasons. But aside from that, it doesn't even get into the possibility, or it really, the analysis can't get into the possibility of a basic right, because it's all about who's a person and who's not. And so it makes it obviously open to a lot of slings and arrows going forward as it has been as science develops uh, in the area. And so the question, you know, the, the question is then not just whether the Supreme Court from its side is carrying on in an interpretive fashion that's more legislative than judicial, it's also whether the court is now subject to the influence of popular opinion in ways that it was specifically set up to supposedly not be. The whole idea of the court setting up precedent for, well, this might become the future you know, view is really more in line with how things were set up. And I mean, I think it, it, it bears noticing the other side of the coin, what I you know, just mentioned, that this is supposed to be a body that is impervious to that popular opinion. And a lot of what Arendt is writing about it is premised on that assumption. And now we're seeing a, you know, sort of a whittling down of, of that independence. I think those are good points. I mean, I think um, the I think the question of the court's relation to public opinion. Um, so let me say, I think you're absolutely right. The court is supposed to be independent of public opinion, and yet, what does the court do? It doesn't just read and decide. You know, it's not an originalist interpretation, at least not as I understand it and certainly not as Arendt understood it, and nor is it a whatever the court wants, you know. <laughs> it has to, in some sense, I mean, this is, again, this is my understanding of how the court works, and I think it's how Arendt understood it too, but I'm not going to, you know, which is that you find the foundational principles, the spirit of the beginning, as she calls it, and you carry it through and you um, apply it to the present. Which means that while the court doesn't and shouldn't pay attention to popular opinion, it has to, in some sense, um, attend to um, the authority of the Constitution, which comes from the fact that people uh, respect and see the Constitution as this carrying through from the founders to the present of what unites us as a people. And thus, it has to, in some sense, um, again, I don't, it's not that public opinion has to be attended to, like on a, on a poll, but it has to be seen as, um, as, in, as, 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 a, as a document above politics. And that means that if its decisions are seen by people to be uh, so opposed to uh, their view of what life is like, if enough of those people see it that way, it will lose its, um, its apolitical and supra-political uh, ideal. And, um, and, and so I don't think the court can be blind to um, when its opinions are seen as violations of uh, the sort of common groundwork of, of the country. 
that makes sense. Go ahead. I just wanted to point out that um, it's interesting to see, talk about Roe v. v. Wade as based on public opinion, when in fact, the failure to enact the 14th Amendment uh, through Plessy v. Ferguson and these other things, which were not, it was never acted on, is just as much a result of public opinion um, as the final enacting of the contraceptive um, uh, decisions, Roe v. Wade, uh, the marriage, um, equal marriage uh, decision. So I think that um, we can easily see that prior to uh, Brown v. Board, uh, they were also based on public opinion and, and trying to deal with that. Yeah, I mean, I, the court has to take, I, 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 I'm, I'm simply, I think what Margaret, as I understood what Margaret said, and, and I'm trying to, I think there's a difference between public opinion and um, sort of a public acceptance of authority. And um, I'm trying to sort of, I'm trying to, I'm just trying to say, I don't think the court should or should take into account like opinion polls or that kind of opinion, but they have to take into account whether the country sees their decisions as legitimate or not. I guess that was the, the point, Susan, that I was trying to make. I don't know if that distinction makes sense does, to you. Margaret, are you trying to say the something? the current or? situation, yeah, I'm wondering if the, uh, the breakdown that it we're seeing in the current situation isn't in fact proof of what Arendt is arguing, that if you don't have that independence in a sort of inviolate way, if you don't have the reverence, then you don't achieve the foundation status that's required to go forward with this enterprise. And we're seeing exactly that now. Um, and, and it is very concerning. I mean, it's, it's part of the substance of the fears that people have with what's going on, uh, you know, in, in not just the view of our judiciary, but in our judiciary right now. Um, so that crisis of confidence, I guess, I mean, you know, is maybe a more popular term, but it's leading, you know, it has the potential to lead to the erosion of, uh, you know, uh, of the court and the Constitution as that absolute function. So I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, I don't Can know. Can I add something quickly, Roger? I, if we follow what Margaret is, was just saying, I mean, I think there's a good argument to be made then that a lot of the distrust that people have for these institutions has been caused by the 14th Amendment, by the Marriage Equality Act, by Roe v. Wade, um, by all of these progressive social wins that have been happening over the past 60 or so years. And what has happened as a result is that abortion, for example, has already been reduced to a federal issue where in a state like Michigan, for example, it's incredibly difficult to get an abortion, whereas in Massachusetts, it's fairly easy. In other states, it's almost impossible. Uh, and at the same time, when we have presidential elections, people have become one issue voters based upon which Supreme Court justices might need to be replaced. And I think there's a strong argument to be made against these social equality um, amendments and decisions. Uh, Roger, is my mic on? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I, the question that comes to my mind is whether or not uh, Arendt is correct in uh, viewing the Supreme Court as this uh, continual constitutional convention. Because then you end up, and, and I think that some of the cases that have been discussed uh, in the last 15 or 20 minutes are illustrative of this, of a constitutional convention consisting of nine people. And the discussion just isn't broad enough and doesn't take in enough different perspectives to have the legitimacy that uh, she claims it's supposed to have. 
I, I think these are all excellent points. I, um, was the Supreme Court ever a constitutional convention in, in continual session? Is it now? Um, uh, both meaningful questions. And, um, and Sam and Margaret's uh, arguments or suggestions that in some ways the, uh, the progressive uh, expansion of certain rights um, has created a constitutional crisis, if I can summarize what they've said in some sense. They can, I'm happy to have them come back. Um, you know, these are, these are important issues. Uh, I mean, to, to what Howard, you just said, I think the entire um, political science approach to the Supreme Court, which is all about vote counting and um, seeing them as you know, ranking them on conservative or liberal issues has a, whether or not they do that, turned the court into a kind of super legislature in the people's mind, which has without a doubt undermined its authority. Uh, um, and increasingly, of course, presidents now um, run as one of the main things that they will be elected for, as Sam just said, um, you know, on the Supreme Court issue, I think it's not, it's not unlikely that Donald Trump would not have won the election if he hadn't gotten the evangelical vote. And he certainly, it was no model Christian. Um, and the main reason he got the evangelical vote is because of his strong promise to promote justices who would um, overturn Roe v. Wade. Um, so the politicization of the court is absolutely um, apparent. I, I think there's an argument to say that the court has always been political and has always had, um, you know, the judgments are always political, but uh, clearly it's, it's, it's been increased or the awareness of it has been increased in ways that matter. I mean, I think one of the questions that we would all need to ask within this conversation is, are you willing to give up Roe v. Wade and some of these other decisions in order to, um, in, Gar in Gary's language, uh, revitalize federalism, and in Margaret and Sam's language, um, return a kind of respect for the court, if I'm understanding all of you correctly. That I think is uh, a question that needs to be asked. Um, and yet it's a very hard question to ask because for many people, these are litmus test issues that if you say anything about them, um, uh, you know, you become politically suspect. That's, that's where I think we're at on, on a lot of these issues. I think just to chime in, I think, um, you know, Roe v. Wade is not the first opinion ever written that is less than stellar. Um, there have been plenty. And in the normal course of events, the court would take on other cases that were in some overlapping way related to that opinion so as to be able to further refine points that perhaps had been a little murky or messy. And I think, you know, what what I'm saying is that, you know, we're seeing this toxicity that, Roger, you just described, where it's now, you know, it's, it's, it's now like kryptonite for the court to take any opinion that might help them do that for an opinion such as Roe v. Wade. Um, I mean, I guess I would argue that the same is true with Citizens United. I mean, it need not be necessarily, you know, in one political corner that there seems to be an acceptance of the idea that, I mean, you know, presidents may not vet all judicial candidates themselves, but it's well known that, you know, this administration has simply gone to the head of the Federalist Society and gotten a list for all levels of the judiciary. And so it's right out there in the open that we have a particular wing of government that is, you know, going to a particular private group of people. 
um, which is, you know, not really how it's supposed to be, regardless of whether the people they choose are talented and equipped for the task. I think that's fair. I mean, Roe v. Wade has certainly already been widely, wildly limited by a series of cases. I think that's what Sam was referring to and the fact that, you know, mm -hmm. it's been so limited in certain ways that in some states it's incredibly difficult to get an abortion today and in others it's quite easy. So um, these things are happening. Um, I'm going to go on. We can come back to this if people want. Paul writes, the same could be said of the Lochner case in the early 20th century in which the court effectively acted as a super legislature in overruling state labor law. My point is simply that the idea that there's um, political dimensions to the court's decision is not new. That's, that's of course, true. Um, the Lochner uh, uh, decision, um, which overruled uh, of laws uh, that were designed to protect or limit the working hours of bakers uh, in the name of, of, of workplace rights, um, uh, was uh, was one of the central um, cases in in this strong idea of uh, of a laissez-faire uh, U.S. idea of of personal contractual freedom, and um, it ended in the 1930s uh, in a series of of cases, 1930s and 40s. Um, so yes, there's always been politics. Uh, in the court. I, I don't want to suggest that I think there's not. I hope I said that earlier. I think I did. It's it's more that um, at some point when the court makes a decision and that decision doesn't become accepted across the country, uh, you, have a, you have a problem where the court um, in its role as uh, a, a, a unifier um, uh, becomes put in question. And, you know, sometimes you believe so strongly that you say, that's okay, we're gonna, we're gonna stick to our guns. The question is how, how often you can do that. And I mean, I think free speech is one of those issues. I mean, there's no doubt that many of the court's free speech decisions um, are uh, unpopular. Um, and different ones are unpopular with different groups. Uh, but and, you know, and, and if we were to have a new constitutional convention now, I'm sure there would be no right to free speech in it. Um, but uh, the question really is, um, you know, is that one of those rights? First of all, it's in the Constitution, unlike um, some of these other issues. And is that one of the rights that we think is so fundamental that even though it's not popular, uh, we're going to to hold on to it? Um, so, uh, you know, and it's become a Central American idea, although I will tell you, as many people, and I think it's not just recently, I think for a long time, most people don't actually believe it. Uh, at least, you know, they, they all think there's speech that should be restricted, but they believe it as a principle. It's become part of the American identity, whereas the right to abortion has not yet reached that level. I think the right to, the, 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 the right to, to not have segregated schools is now an American right that has been widely accepted. And so in some sense, this is, go back to Margaret's point, in some sense, the court, when it makes these decisions, has to succeed in creating a sense that the rights it's uh, articulating, even if they're not right at that moment, will become and do become sort of seen as essential American rights. And that's a, and that's the gamble that I think is part of Supreme Court jurisprudence. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Jack writes that the Ninth Amendment leaves lots of room for declaration and defense of rights not enumerated in the Constitution. The enumeration of the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage other retained by the people. Yeah. Um, and also the Tenth Amendment, which reserves rights to the states. These are these are two amendments that um, were widely uh, used and articulated in in the 19th century, 
and early 20th century and have become uh, out of fashion today. I think someone earlier, I think it was Margaret, mentioned the Federalist Society. Well, these are, these are rights that the Federalist Society uh, cares deeply about. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I actually, I did an interview on NPR Morning Edition once that they never aired. And I think the main reason they didn't air it is because I, I mentioned these, these rights and, you know, argued that there was a progressive case for them. And the host went nuts on, in the interview and said, how can you say that? That's like conservative. And I said, well, A, I'm not sure it's conservative. And B, is that an argument against it? And she then went really nuts. Of course, that interview didn't get aired. Um, but, uh, you know, there's an idea right now that federalism is a conservative idea, conservative idea. That's an idea that emerged largely in the 80s and 90s after uh, liberal courts in the 60s and 70s had um, expanded certain federal rights. Now, um, the liberal uh, legal establishment is turning back to federalism and starting to find a liberal, fe a liberal federalism because they're afraid that a conservative Supreme Court um, will take away many of these rights or limit them in certain ways, and thus they want to try and empower liberal state courts and liberal states to, um, to create alternative jurisdictions. And so what you've seen is that the idea of federalism has become politicized in such a way that when the court is liberal, the conservatives embrace federalism, and when the court is conservative, the liberals embrace, embrace federalism. Um, what I've tried to articulate in reading these two chapters with you is that for Arendt, the embrace of federalism is not a political principle or not a political interest, it's a political principle that's based in freedom. That the argument for federalism is not that it will give us abortion or take away abortion or give us segregation or take away segregation. It's that it is essential for the constitution of freedom uh, which is that people can uh, part participate and govern themselves. And Roger? yeah. It's interesting because Hannah Arendt's solution to the problem of the Middle East would have been a federalist solution. And she writes of that quite um, deeply that Israel should never have become a nation on its own, and nationalism would probably have been. Uh, much attenuated by a federalist structure. So that's what. You're absolutely right, Daphna. I mean, uh, she she was, um, even before she moved to the United States in the 1940s, or 30s and 40s, actually she had moved to the States in 40s, so around that time, but before she had thought, uh, I think, in any way deeply about the American federalist system, um, in her analysis of Europe and then her analysis of Israel, she came to the conclusion that the nation state was an oxymoron and was dead. The nation state being two things, a state which treats everybody equally and a nation in which there's one nationality which has, which is the nationality of the state and thus you have first class and second class citizens. And she saw this as a problem in the minority treaties in Europe between World War I and World War II that very much led to the problem of refugees. And she saw this again as a, a huge problem with the, um, in 1942 and 44, with the Biltmore Declaration in New York and then the Atlantic City uh, World Jewish Zionist Congress in 1944, where for the first time the labor Zionists who had always seen Zionism as an individual act of people returning to um, uh, greater Israel, but not as a state, but as, a, as, as people, as individuals, was for the first time replaced by Jabotinsky's um, uh, revisionist Zionism, which said that Zionism means a state, a Jewish state of Israel uh, without Arabs from on both sides of the River Jordan. And she was, and then she then in 1946 published in the journal Menorah a very famous and important essay called Zionism Reconsidered, 
in which she says that um, this idea of Zionism uh, will make it impossible for um, Israel to exist and not be uh, a state in which it has second class citizens within it, uh, which I think has been um, unfortunately borne out. Um, uh, she deeply believed that the only ethical and free political system that could emerge in a modern world is one of federated states in which different within states there were different federations that could have freedom to live the way they wanted to and she saw the united states and its constitution as a model for that later on uh, the problem is and we've talked about this a lot in our reading group over the last year or so is that that actually requires respecting people who want to live differently from you it actually requires the jews letting the arabs live as arabs and the arabs letting the jews live as jews and it also requires us letting the southern people live as southern people and the um the orthodox communities in the catskills living as orthodox communities and muslim communities in certain cities living as muslim communities and it requires an actual plurality and a kind of humility where what we say is our country is not about telling people how to live it's about letting as many people live freely in communities as possible without breaking apart and um you can't do that if you think you know how everyone should live and people who live differently from you don't have a right to live that way and and that is the issue I think that's one of the core issues of her politics. It's very unpopular today um, with people on both sides who think they, everyone should live the way um, they think they should live. Um, Kevin writes, I'm a bit startled as I read this chapter and listened to your discussion of it to detect a sort of structural similarity between RN's concerns and the argument an argument and that of Leo Strauss. I don't want to overstate this. There are obviously profound differences there, but am I wrong to think they are both responding to the breakdown of authority in some way, nihilism on Strauss's part, and that both see in some way the positive side of a kind of worship of a founding and the constitution as a bulwark of a new authoritarian or fascism. One key difference would be that Arendt thinks we can be aware of this somewhat arbitrary creation of authority without that necessarily being dangerous, while Strauss seems to stress the need to keep some kind of understanding hidden from the masses, a kind of esoteric knowledge available primarily to elites who need to use it to continue to recreate the worship of constitution and founding among the masses. Um, is there, a, have others seen a similarity? Well, okay, Kevin, so on the one hand, um, Strauss and Arendt obviously knew each other. Uh, they had both studied in Germany uh, near each other. Um, but they had very different um, political approaches. Um, Strauss, so far as I know, doesn't see uh, the authority of the American Constitution in Federalist in federalism. Uh, um, you know, he sees it. Uh, he he has a natural law foundation um, to. Uh, that he thinks um, a kind of esoteric elite uh, can access and impose on others. Um, there are parts of Strauss's work, and 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 um, Rob Howes has recently written a really wonderful book on Strauss's international uh, politics, which makes Strauss into much more of a pluralist than he's usually thought to be. Um, I'm not going to remember the arguments enough to, to go into them here. I apologize. But if you're interested in that, um, Rob House, H-O-W-S-E, has a really wonderful book on Strauss, which reads him against the grain as a much more uh, libertarian and freedom-oriented, not libertarian in the sense of libertarianism, but a much more liberty-focused thinker than is typically imagined um, that he is. Um, so, uh, I know he and Arendt had a very different temperaments 
but I don't know enough about his um, his his politics to say much more. But my understanding is he wasn't a Federalist, but I could be wrong. If you know more, Kevin, I'm happy to hear. Or if anyone does. Kevin, do you want to add anything or should I go on? So Johanna writes, I think that the lost tradition Roger mentions also meant that the U.S. also. Oh, Kevin, do you want to add something? I was just going to say I'm in kind of a noisy place. So probably if I just listen as best. Uh, very nice response. Thank you. Okay. Johanna writes, I think that the lost tradition that Roger mentions also meant that the U.S. also could not judge revolutionary situations in other countries. And this meant not choosing the right side and has resulted at times in ending in disaster for the people involved with the American troops. I'm thinking about a situation like the Bay of Pigs or even Vietnam. If indeed there was ever this tradition, how is the U.S. to recoup this revolutionary and subsequent constitutional spirit? Would it help the U.S. make better global decisions regarding foreign policy? The price of war has been high. Yeah, well, um, one, of the, uh, one of the things that Hannah Arendt saw as central to the U.S., was that it was not a nation state, and that it was uh, it was it was in her mind the first and most successful um, constitutional republic, uh, and thus not one that had a national um, uh, a national uh, main group that uh, everyone would have to assimilate to. Um, I should say as a parenthesis that the critique of that, uh, which hasn't been aimed just at our ends, but I think is there, is that the the national people of the United States has been whiteness, and that all immigrant groups, including the Jews, could become Americans by becoming white. And that um, the one group that that was less available to or unavailable to, depending on how you understand passing and other things like that, uh, were African Americans, um, and so that would be uh, uh, an argument that our Indians would have to address. I think it's an important argument to address. But because it wasn't a nation state, um, and because it was a state in which there was largely federal and decentralized power, um, our thought that the United States was was largely not an imperialist country um, and that it was protected against imperialism by its decentralized and federal structure. So the corollary, you know, I've been, we've been raising some questions of today about progressivism and the progressive, the, 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 the nationalization of power driven by progressives on the left who have an idea of how everybody should live. Well, the other side of that, and it's the reason why Arendt's neither a left nor a right, but she's independent, is that she thinks that the, um, the, the other main influence that has increased the power of and the size of the national government has been the uh, emergence of a national security state, which she's deeply critical of. And um, uh, she was very critical in the 1940s and 50s and 60s of the rise of this whole CIA, national security state, defense establishment that um, led the United States to become a world power, uh, which made it in court, which required it to make decisions um, not for its citizens, but to preserve a kind of, of world order. And she was deeply critical of that um, uh, imperialist uh, rise that happened in the latter part of the 20th century. Um, so one, if we were to return the United States to a kind of more localized uh, federalist system, on the one hand, it would be a a uh, hit to the progressive idea that um, some of us have talked about, but it would also be uh, uh, opposed to and a hit to the kind of um, U.S. imperialist uh, adventures that Johanna you're talking about. So I think she sees 
movements towards a nationalist uh, view of the country on both the left and the right for different reasons. Um, and she would be, I think, uh, supportive of efforts to roll back both of them. Margaret writes, case law is built on precedent used as the means to assess the situation in the present. So there's a strong linkage to the past and to foundation. The Supreme Court's decisions affect laws is intentional. It's neither new nor outside their job description. Uh, that's certainly true. And it's this very act of deciding with the principle of the past in the present that our end finds the source of authority in the Supreme Court and the Constitution. I hope I didn't say anything against that. Daphne says, I'm interested in the Leo Strauss Hahn Arendt equivalency in Kevin's chat, but not sure I understand the idea of worship of founding the Constitution. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think, um, I mean, Strauss uh, makes what's, what Kevin was referring to as an esoteric argument that there are, um, that there are truths uh, that not, are not accessible to everybody in all great writing. Uh, and that only those few who are able to can interpret them. Um, this is certainly not Arendt's view. Um, uh, she does, I mean, the one, the one place, and we're going to get to this next week, uh, the one place where she talks about elitism and has some very interesting things to say about it is at the very end of the book, the last 10 pages of the book. Uh, and what she's going to say is, there's different kinds of elitism. There's an elitism based on birth. There's an elitism based on money. Uh, there's elitism based on education. All of these elitisms she rejects. But she says, it's also the case that in a political democracy, it has never been true that most people want to spend a lot of their time engaging in discourse, dialogue, and politics. And so what you need is a political elite to emerge, not one through parties and party structures where you get ahead by being corrupt, but one through local organizations where people who, like Gary has done, you know, work in politics, get picked because they're good and get elevated up to be the leader and then they meet with other people who've been picked because they're good and they work and the people who move up become the leader and you create from the bottom up in her view a political elite um, of people who are actually good and successful at representing uh public ideas um and and that's uh and that's her view of elitism very different from strauss's view of elitism which is a top-down elitism of a kind of Mandarin few. She had absolute contempt for Strauss on that idea. Kevin writes, worship is a strong word and I'm trying to get at Arendt's idea that fairly quickly the founding and constitution came to be treated with a kind of reverence. She says worship, so we can stick with that. And that seems similar to me, Strauss is thinking about the founding. Yeah, except that again, her idea of worship of the constitution is not based on, again, a kind of Mandarinism or intellectualism, it was based on an idea of uh, the fact that people saw the Constitution and came to see it as this document that embodied the founding spirit of America, which was freedom and authority somehow coexisting. Um, that's not Strauss's idea of, uh, of reverence that he's talking about. He's talking about natural law, which is something quite different. And a few people who have the ability to interpret it. Yeah, Jeffrey Isaac has written a lot on this um, in Democracy in Dark Times. Uh, but again, we'll talk about this idea of the elite next class, next discussion, when we talk about um, the revolutionary tradition. Let me remind you that the revolutionary tradition is a long chapter. Uh, uh, it's probably, I think it's probably the longest chapter. Well, no, the social question in it, but it's, 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 uh, it's almost, it's about 60 pages. 
So make sure you give yourself some time to read it. Um, it's an extraordinary chapter. If I remember correctly, Dan, we're meeting in two weeks. If that's maybe he's on, maybe not, but check to make sure what the schedule works. And um, is that right? Uh, we're um, meeting in. We're meeting on December first. Oh, in three weeks. So after after. Can um, you hear me? Yeah, after Thanksgiving. So you have three weeks to read this long chapter. Enjoy it, and uh, I look forward to discussing it with you. Keep reading, Arendt. Thanks very much.